we're going to have now our talk, right? Uh, and sanctuary is the theme of the month, as you know by far at this point. Sanctuary is, you know, is originally meant a sacred place, but I think we can take this meaning for, you know, just a place where we all feel that we belong to or we have a sense of community, right? And what is Creative Mornings but a huge community, right? And the speaker of the day is very dear to Creative Mornings. Most of you, not, not necessarily most of you, but some of you probably know her from Creative Mornings, actually, because she was at this spot before all, I think, was, was it? Yeah, nice. Uh, so we're having today Victoria Stoyanova. Uh, she is the founder of the Institute of Belonging, and she worked extensively with a lot of amazing brands like Meta, Ikea, and I forgot the third I was going to mention, but a lot of interesting, nice brands. Yeah, most of, uh, of them you know. So please, a round of applause to Victoria. <laughs> Welcome, Victoria. Thank you. And also the slides. Good morning, everybody. Oh my God, it's a big crowd. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of brand new faces. Is anyone's first Creative Mornings today? Holy shit, high five. <laughs> high five, high five. Pete, good morning. Anyone here? Hi, babe. Wow, wow, high five over there. This is amazing. Um, may I please have my slides? Pew! No? They will come up. But I want to say uh, Creative Mornings is a very special community for me. As Fernando said, I was on the other side of the stage for a long time, for seven years. And there's something kind of magical to be on the other side. Um, this community has been my sanctuary in a lot of ways, and I would love to share more about, yeah, what ways we can build community and find our sanctuaries. When you think about this word sanctuary, I would love to know what comes to mind. Maybe close your eyes for a second. Take a deep breath into your belly. What is the last time you felt this sensation of being really calm and at ease, peaceful, connected, safe? Was it a place or a person or a body sensation? You can open your eyes so I don't lose anyone falling asleep. <laughs> Would anyone like to share any words or places that came to mind? Yeah? In your tent in the Cotswolds, amazing. Anyone else? In a hug, yes. Hugs are sanctuaries. Yeah? Outdoor spaces. Absolutely. Yes. Me time. Damn right. So we think about it in this way of, uh, you know, maybe it's this, I think of a, of a spa moment in somewhere beautiful where I'm on my own. I can just read my poetry, drink my herbal tea, and be very undisturbed. And it means a lot of different things for different people. But community has definitely been a sanctuary for me. Um, I've worn many different hats. And I truly believe that something magical happens in that precise moment when people find their people. When you are in a room, maybe like today, and you're not too sure in the beginning, what is it, why are you here? But then at some point you look around and you just whisper to the person next to you, these are my people. And this is a little bit the connecting tissue of my work. Community has been everywhere. So I moved to London 10 years ago to open a space 
with um, at Agency Mother, and there was something cool about bridging people who wouldn't necessarily be together in the same room. So it was a lot of big companies with a lot of cool new startups doing crazy tech. This was very early days of tech in London. It was not as it is today. And there was that electric moment of people coming together and saying, oh, wait, we can do something. What is it going to be? How are we going to do it? And after that, I went to work for a hackathon company where complete strangers will get together, hundreds of them, and spend 48 hours building a company. And it was quite of an insane thing. You could really feel that energy of the Friday night. People are like, what am I doing here? Where is the exit? How the hell do I go out of this? Um, but then by the Friday night, uh, by the Sunday night, when they're on stage presenting their company that they've built for, for the weekend, they really have this like feeling of, oh, these are the same people who watch weird documentaries, and they're on the same Reddit subchannels as me, and actually, now I know that I have this community of people I can just reach out to and do cool things with. And so that's been a moment that I have found again and again and again in all the different communities. Um, I most recently worked at Facebook, working um, in a very cool new team that was all about community and all about um, funding and connecting and supporting community leaders, which was very special. And there was that same thing. Joya, who's here, has experienced some of that, of being in a room with 100 strangers who do and experience things that you thought you were the only one with that experience. You thought you were the only person who faced the same challenges and um, questions, but then all of a sudden you realize it's a lot more people than that. So these are just some um, examples. But while I've been building community for work, I've also been a part of many super interesting communities. And people often think, oh, it's quite a straightforward thing. You find a community, you join, and then that's it. But it's really not that straightforward. Communities are a lot more like dating, you know? You go, you find out a little bit more about these people, they found a little bit more about you, you get more. Um, you try to find out what the vibe is. And then most of the time, communities come together because of questions. Not because they have the answers and they are all the experts in that particular field, but because they share the same questions and they want to explore together what the answers might be. I really love this real kick um, quote where he talks in his letters to a young poet, to this young poet, and he says, you know what, you don't need to have all the answers. He says, try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign language. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given to you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. And there's that real sense of we gather with people who are exploring the same questions. And maybe we'll never find the answers, but that's the real beauty of it. There's many beautiful communities I have the chance to be a part of. I just want to share a few of them. One is on being, from on being project. Some of you might be familiar with that. A community that came and found me at the time where I was thinking, is anyone paying remote attention to what I'm trying to do to the community world, to how we're connecting, to where the research is? And I really felt like I was on my own trying to do this work in London and then all of a sudden, there was a group of 10 of us who would spend time with um, an organization who is dedicated to asking a lot of big questions and not necessarily having the answers, but actually keeping the questions. Um, another one is the Point People, which is a collective of system designers. They're all women. And the special thing with that collective is that, for me, this is a 
lifetime community. We've spent a decade together, we'll probably spend another decade more, and it's super weird to know people's milestones and life events and to really feel like you're part of people's lives. And a lot of it is around making sense. What is this particular social and cultural moment that we're living? How are we unlocking it? What does it mean for us as a collective, but for us as part of a bigger organizations and society? And there's something really special about whenever you feel like you don't have well, whenever you feel like you need courage to say where you're actually at emotionally and experientially, this is the thing that connects. This is the thing that is the social glue. There is this really simple pyramid of intimacy where um, we talk about, if you talk to people about everyday things like the weather, guess what? You're not connecting very deeply. But the pyramid goes up and up, and the highest level is around hopes and dreams and fears. And when you connect with people about hopes and dreams and fears, whew, there's something at stake. You're sharing something personal, um, you're sharing something quite vulnerable, and you don't know how that's going to be received. And that's the magical thing with communities like that, is that they're really built on trust, and trust takes time, it takes time spent, it takes, um, it takes courage. So I remember in December we had a meeting with this group and there was a question around, what's inspiring you right now? And I was like, nothing's inspiring me right now. Actually, I'm not in a very inspired phase. And I was trying to think about what's a cool thing I can mention just to, you know, be in with my friends who are very, always very inspiring and they have interesting things going on. And I was like, okay, whatever, I'm just gonna say it. And I was surprised. Many people actually said, yep, it's not a very inspiring phase. Actually, the world is a bit weird right now and that's okay. And that sense of relief of like, <coughs> okay, I'm not absolutely crazy. There's actually, um, Often those things that feel very deeply personal are very deeply collective. And the more we find spaces to share them, the more long-lasting and meaningful communities we can build. Last one I'm sharing is Sandbox, which is a global collective of people who are doing quite interesting things. It was built around the premise of if leaders of tomorrow meet in their 20s, what would happen and what would they achieve together. And so the entrance threshold is quite big and complicated, but once you're in, the level of trust is phenomenal. So people would open their door to you, you would stay in their homes, they would make referrals, introductions, they would do anything because you are part of this collective. And I've met some of my closest friends through, through that, it's a very beautiful, beautiful collective. And sometimes though, you don't have the people to explore the questions with. You're like, okay, there's something I wanna see, how does that work, where do I take it? But you don't have the in reach people who are asking the same questions. And that's the amazing opportunity for you to host a community and to give it a go, to see what happens when you ask the questions. So this is an example of a poetry event called Poetica that we run with a group of friends. Uh, it started very spontaneously on a Sunday. We had a friend with an empty mini co-working space, Lewis, some of you might know him. And we just wanted to experiment with intimacy. What would happen if we take poetry out of more academic, more institutional places, and we put it in very unexpected places. In, in this case, um, a small gallery of Hackney Road, but we later did industrial estates and kebab shops and laundromats. And it was really fun to see that poetry has this really big um, connection property because it's so intimate, because it's not words that we hear every day because it's words that when are read to us one-on-one -on -one can be really powerful. So we played a lot with that. 
another example of an opportunity to hold the moment that we're in and do something around it was um, this practice party, which we hosted at the end of the pandemic as we were all getting ready to come out of lockdown. <laughs> and so the practice party was about having these very serious doctors who would ask you questions about your social life and um, your levels of socializing and social anxiety, and they would prescribe you things to do at the party. So they actually wrote all these little notes saying, you need to do three elbow squeezes and one big hug at the party. And it was silly, but it was just real. And so a lot of these opportunities to gather are around these real sticky social moments. So we're hosting something similar next week, which is around the theme, GPT made me do it. So we're all kind of obsessed with the language models and what they can do, but like, what does it mean if they explain to us how to dress for a party? Is it gonna get creative? Is it gonna get weird? Is it gonna get funny? At the moment, it's still, <laughs> it, it can do better, but it's just fun to, to explore. And so communities really can feed our inner worlds in a way that is beautiful and real and quite magical. But it's only one way around. What can also happen is that the inner worlds can feed our community life and our outer worlds. And the last few years have been quite different for me and I imagine for you, uh, I spend a lot of time on my own. So my social persona was a bit put to bed and I was spending a lot of time thinking about what is this inner world and how do I cultivate it more and now if I'm not spending all this time externally hosting things, doing things, going to events, being the community person, who am I if I'm not doing these things that have defined me for so long? And so I did some radical things. <laughs> I quit my job. I was like, okay, there is a, an authenticity thing that's happening where um, I did, I took my meditation practice seriously and went quite deep into who am I when I'm not that person out there that is doing? And can I be more that person who is sensing and being? And it's a weird thing, but I started feeling like I want the boundary between the outer world and my professional world, and that boundary that's between my inner self and how I do things on an everyday internally. I wanted that boundary to be as thin as possible and if possible to disappear. The lovely poet Rumi says, you think of yourself as a citizen of the universe. You think you belong to this world of dust and matter. Out of this dust, you have created a personal image and have forgotten about the essence of your true origin. That really spoke to me because as creative people, we're always told like, your personal brand, where is your website? Who is your work persona? There's such an emphasis of how you project yourself externally, but there's very little about how do you cultivate the essence and the awe of your inner life. Of course, there's a lot of things around meditation and mental health and very Im important ways that come more as a cure of a symptom than just a playful way to cultivate a different inner state. So I got really interested in how do I get this inner state to be a uh, a central part of my practice. And so I had left my job, did a few freelance projects, and then I was like, this is not enough. I'm going on a sabbatical. Um, it was poorly timed, hello recession, but it felt necessary and it felt true, truthful. There was something about the inner world affects the community world 
affects the ecosystem piece. And I thought, I'm spending so much time with clients trying to make people feel a sense of belonging at work, to feel like they're connected to their colleagues, to their mission, to what they do every day. And I was like, if I don't feel that, there's no way I can actually teach other people how to do it. And there was a <laughs> sense of hypocrisy. I was like, I can't do that. If I don't feel like I can really feel inspired and connected in this moment in time, why would, would I think that other people can do it? And so I really took time off completely. It was a, a bit radical. <laughs> My dad was not ha very happy about it. But it felt like the only thing I can do. And also, I was back working to myself, and I thought, if I don't feel that I have the power to take time out when I feel like I need it, nobody's going to give it to me. No one will say, Victoria, here is three months off because you deserve some time off to get into this new um, stage. And I felt like I just owe that to myself. And so I, I just, yeah, I just wanted to be a poem for a bit. I just wanted to step back and back and back and actually step completely out. What happened? <laughs> what happened? Um, well, it's still happening. Let's put it that way. I just wanted to know what is that state of feeling a sense of belonging to myself and what setup I need to design for that to happen. What are the elements in my day, in my week, in my um, month that I need to put in place to feel like I really have the sense of belonging to myself? I'll ask you once more to close your eyes and to think about that question. When is the last time you felt a deep sense of belonging to yourself? And what was the setup? You're going to open your eyes. I won't ask you to share, but you can share with your neighbor or neighbors in a little bit when we close. I learned that for me, the setup has a lot of nature in it. A lot more, a lot more trees and tree trunks and connection to nature than I ever thought I needed. I learned a lot about emotions and processing emotion and communicating emotion from beautiful Tibetan Buddhist teachings. Happy to share that later on. And I learned that I'm really interested not only in the mechanisms of connection and building community, but I'm really interested in how community feels on a body level in terms of phenomenology. So I've kind of shifted my practice to be a lot more taking in consideration the inner parts of that um, practice, not just the external pieces of community works like this, and these are the methodologies, and these are the bits and bobs that we need to put together. I still work with some lovely, lovely people, and I write about it um, when I can. Um, but I'd love to hear from you and how this resonates and what your inner practices are. Thank you.